well it's an old movie i've got it here titanic and it's a film of course that contains many gripping scenes i imagine you've seen it let remind let me remind you of just one it comes just after the captain the engineer and the owner of the uh, boat and a handful of others have come to the realization that the great ship will soon be at the bottom of the ocean and at that point the director takes you around the boat and it's a scene of jollity and grandeur. The first class passengers don't have a care in the world. They're oblivious to the reality. The ship's going to sink, but they have no idea. And what a scene it is. The boat is, of course, the pinnacle of luxury. The chandeliers are resplendent. There are wide curved staircases that are regal. Everywhere glitters and is furnished in gold leaf. The drinks are free and the people are dripping with jewels. Most are attired in the latest and most expensive clothes that money can buy. And there they all are. And I'm sure if you did a vox pop with any of those passengers in the first class uh, 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 and you asked them to assess their situation, if you said, how's life? They'd say, what are you kidding? We're rich, we're happy, we haven't a care in the world, we're on the Titanic. But as you watch the scene, your assessment is quite different. You see the whole picture. You know the reality. You actually feel pity for them because you know that actually they're blind to the tragedy that is going to engulf them in an hour or so. They may be in the finest clothes. In fact, they're poor. Uh, nothing will save them from their impending doom. That's the reality. You actually see it in the shipbuilder, Mr. Andrew's eyes. The Irish eyes are not smiling. Now, can I say this? When it comes to the Christian faith, You'll never understand it. You'll never understand the Christian faith, never, unless you understand that we too are in a titanic situation and we must run to the lifeboat. The Bible's view of the world is that we're as doomed and in as need in rescue of rescue as those passengers on the Titanic. So you can swap the, swap the chandeliers on the Titanic for the spars of St. Paul's Cathedral. You can swap the decks for the pavements of Regent Street. You can swap the passengers for the pedestrians on Oxford Street. But actually, we are in desperate need of rescue. How on earth can that be? Well, Mark chapter 15 outlines this need of rescue. It shows us why that's the case. It's all about the death of Jesus. That's the lifeboat. Let's have a look at the rescue. And I've got three headings for you. Verse 33, God was angry. Verse 34, Jesus was abandoned. Verse 38, we can be accepted. So first of all, God was angry. Can we see verse 33? At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. Now, can I say some commentators think this is an eclipse, but an eclipse happens when actually the sun is here, the moon is here, and the shadow of the sun's rays on the moon Cause, causes an eclipse. But this is Passover. <sighs> the, the, the moon is over here. No, it's supernatural. God is intervening. And darkness in the daytime in the Bible means one thing. It means that God is acting in judgment. So in the Old Testament, there are days of darkness when God judges Egypt because Pharaoh will not release the Jews from slavery. Darkness means God is angry. Light symbolizes God's presence, his favor. Darkness tells us that he's acting in punishment. It's interesting, there's a star in the middle of the night, light when Jesus is born, and there's darkness in the middle of the day when he dies. Now we may uh, uh, not like this talk of God's anger because we experience anger as something wild and unpredictable. Perhaps you're from a family where someone is like this, where there's wild, unpredictable temper, can I say, I'm so sorry, but that is nothing like this. God's anger is his settled, controlled, personal hostility to that which is wicked and evil and sinful in his world. God says, it is my world, and how you treat me matters to God, and how I treat you matters to God, and how we treat the world matters to God. Oh, look, you know, I've got a friend who was uh, killed by drunk driving. I hate drunkenness. I hate bad driving. There's nothing I can do about it but tell you. But God is not like some benign grandfather who leans back as the grandchildren are mucking around and says, sweep it under the carpet. 
No, no, God says, I will act in punishment against the evil in my world. Lying matters to God, selfishness matters to God, deceit matters to God, war crimes matter to God, six million Jews matter to God. It, it all matters to him and he has the power to punish it. But here's the issue. When God gets angry against sin and has the power to punish it, the extraordinary thing is, is who is punished? Who is judged? So we're told God is angry because he's judging sin, he's punishing it. But the question that leaves is this, who was being punished? Who was God punishing? And the staggering thing here is verse 34. It is Jesus that was abandoned. Verse 34, at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Elo, Elo, Lamech, Sabbathani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So the cry tells us Jesus is abandoned. That's the truth at the heart of what we see here. Jesus was abandoned by God. Jesus was being punished. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And as you probably know, the word here for God is not Abba, which is the intimate word for God. It's Eloi, it's the far off word for God. And although he's in physical agony, I mean, there's 60 million slaves in the ancient world and the way in which you keep them in order is you crucify them. Although he's in physical agony and we get the word excruciating from the Latin word crux cross, that's not what he's speaking of here. It's a relational agony. God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you rejected me? Why have you turned your back on me? Well, it's because the cross is the lifeboat. Can I say, when you look at the cross, what do you see? It's not just a Galilean carpenter dying. He's dying there for me, in my place, taking the punishment for the sins that I deserve. The Bible says, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. It's as though, well, here's the video from that Titanic film. And it's as though everything in my life is on it. Now, just to say there are many things that we want to applaud. The Bible calls that common grace, that there are amazing things about human beings. Achievements, selflessness, love in the family, generosity. So this is a record of a life and there's so much to be applauded on here. Uh, the classroom, the college, the arts, the sports field. Well, I, I've watched the Olympics. It's amazing to see what people can achieve physically. Now, just to see, we want to applaud that. We want to say it's amazing. But there's also much on this video of a life, your life or mine, of which we're mighty ashamed. Can I say, if that's not true of yours, your life is very different from mine. There are dark rooms on here. There's a chilling moment in the film, the talented Mr. R Ripley, when Tom Damon, Tom Ripley, at one point says to his lover, don't you just take the past and put it in a room in the basement, unlock the door and never go there. Well, can I say God does know. There are things that we've said and done and thought, things that are impure, unkind or untrue, and they're on this. Interestingly, the Bishop of London says, we make no spiritual progress until we look within and take responsibility for what we see. So there's the video here of what we've done wrong, what we've said, what we've thought, the sins of omission and commission. But also on this video, above all, is the way we've treated God. We've lived as functional atheists. Oh, he might be there, but we keep him at the fringe. We take the gifts, fun, family, friends, falling in love, food, fitness. We reject the giver. I took a funeral once and the next door gravestone to the funeral I was taking, there was a gravestone there that said, to Alfie, as he always said, I'm the boss. Well, if we do that, and if we ignore God and use him and blame him, can I tell you, it breaks relationships. And God will actually confirm what we've said. We keep saying to God, leave me alone. Well, we will, he will leave us alone. So the Bible speaks of a place called hell, where we're without God and without his many gifts. There is a place called hell. But amazingly, come back to verse 34 with me, if you would. My God, my God, why have you rejected me? In other words, why have you left me alone? It's an extraordinary thing. Jesus says, why have I been left alone? It's as though here I am and here is all my wrongdoing, this video. I don't know, what would be the worst thing on here that you're most ashamed of? It's all there. And one day, 
God at judgment will hold me accountable for it. And here it is, and it cuts me off from God. But here is Jesus on the cross crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it's as though all my wrongdoing is laid on him. So he is forsaken so that I can never be. That's what happens at the cross. Can I ask you again, what's the worst thing you've ever done? Perhaps no one knows. You're so ashamed of it. Well, can I tell you, Jesus died to take that, to pay for it. He was forsaken, so we need never be. Well, what does it mean? It means that we can be accepted. Verse 37, 38, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain, of the, uh, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. So there is Jesus. He's dying on the cross, but this is a commentary. It's as though the camera swings across the city to the temple. And when you got to the temple, in front of the Holy of Holies where God dwelt, there was a great curtain. It was as thick as a man's hand. And it was a great no entry sign. It said you cannot come into the presence of God because your sin will cause you to be killed by a holy God. One man once a year went in behind that curtain and he had a rope round his waist in case he had to be pulled out because he'd be struck down by his sin. And yet as Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As he cries out, it is finished. He's saying, I've paid. I've paid for all your wrongdoing. Now the question is, will you allow Jesus to do that? Will you say, yes, that's for me? At the cross, there's such blindness around the cross. The soldiers, they're just crucifying him. They can't see he's dying for them. The religious authorities, they shout out, he saved others, let him save himself. They can't, say, they can't see that he's dying to save me. The spectator says, well, let's see if Elijah saves him. He's just there for the show. But what about you? As you look at the cross, what do you see? Do you see Jesus dying, paying for your sin? So what will you do with your sin? Will you pay for it yourself in hell? Or will you take it to the cross and allow Jesus to pay for you?